I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. This is The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. The series where I talk to notable people about five of their defining things. The way it works is my guests always choose a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. The reason I devised this series is I wanted to create a slightly different way to gain an insight into the real lives and thoughts of prominent people. Monica McInerney is one of the standout stars of Australian fiction, having penned a host of much-loved number one bestsellers. Every bit as warm, wise and engaging in person as she is on the page, in this conversation we shed some tears and share some laughs as her five choices reveal the childhood and stories that shaped her. I obviously read all my guests' uh, choices and and watch the films and research the songs and places, etc. But because, to my shame, I... Uh, had never read one of your books. I do apologise. I, 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 right. I mean, I, I read quite a lot, but I never had. Um, so I, I read The Godmothers, and I, I am a sugar addict, I need to tell you before I do this. It was like eating ice cream. I couldn't put it down. My, it was absolutely sensational. And, and I was, I, I'll change the names because I don't want to spoil anything for anyone not lucky enough yet to have read The Godmothers, but but I, I would come in and say to my wife, oh my God, she's going out with so-and-so, not him, <laughs> go out with Steve, <laughs> the quiet one. <laughs> uh, it was uh, it was such an enjoyable read. I am now going to work my way through your back catalogue, which is huge. Oh, uh, you'll be busy, but thank you very much. I'm thrilled to hear that. Oh, it was just, just so sensational. And there's a there's a painting in it, Carnation Lily Lily Rose by John Sargent, that that has quite a sort of significant part in the book. I don't want to give away any of the story. Um, and I just wanted to ask before we get into your choices, uh, uh, is that because secretly it's got a really important part in your life, or, or you just? put it in the book? Not at all. I knew when I began writing this novel that art would be important through through it, and it is in the way that art can give solace in all sorts of ways when we're going through difficult times in our lives. And I wanted a painting to be really important between two of the characters, the mother and daughter who are at the heart of the novel. And I went to the Tate Gallery in London, and I went. I gave myself a day to walk through all the extraordinary galleries in the Tate and on the search for a painting that was going to matter to those two characters. And I I hadn't researched beforehand. I thought I'm going to wait and walk into all the different galleries until one, obviously not not um, physically, leapt off the wall at me. And uh, and I went through this gallery and that gallery, and then I came around a corner, and there was this enormous painting standing in front of me. And I'm five foot seven, and it it was you know three times as at the height of me, and it took my breath away. It's the most beautiful painting of two young girls in a summer garden surrounded by carnations and lilies and roses, and they're lighting um, Chinese lanterns. And the painter, John Singer Sargent, has done this extraordinary thing with blush pink and red paint that looks like they're glowing from within. And I thought this is it. This is my special painting. And I was particularly pleased because I had never heard of this painting before. And I thought, I have somehow found this really special rare jewel in the Tate collection that I'm going to use in my book, The Godmothers. And it's going to be really matter to, you know, it's going to really matter to these two two characters. And I stood in front of it, I reckon, for half an hour. Just the, the detail of it is so beautiful. And, and my hobby is nature photography. And I was looking what he can do with, um, you know, with paint to create nature. And I was quite overcome by it, just the beauty of it and, and working out in my head how I was going to use this very rare painting in the Tate. Then I walked out into the Tate Gallery shop to find an entire wall 
covered in souvenirs of carnation lily, lily rose. And it turns out it's the Tate's you know, number one most popular painting. And I could and I did uh, buy um, tea towels. Uh, I bought brooches. I bought earrings, a tote bag, an umbrella, a scarf, um, a um, glasses case, a coaster, <laughs> the whole range of this allegedly rare painting. Um, but I still use it and I love it. And I've been talking about it. You know, anybody that's reading the book, I'm showing them photographs of it. And, yeah, it's still a very special painting to me, even though it's, you know, world famous, as it turns out. Oh, I'm so glad I asked that question because, I mean, the, the book, <laughs> The Godmothers, is, is, it's just a delight. But that was one particular, just one of the particular things in it that, that really struck me and stayed with me. And I suspected it would have, you know, there'd be something behind that. Um, now, we're going to go to your first choice, which on Five of My Life is always the film. Uh, and you've chosen the film that is one of the most regularly chosen alongside cinema Paradiso, bizarrely. Um, you've chosen The Sound of Music, the 1965 Julie Andrews classic. Um, talk to us about that. Well, I feel a bit sorry for you because I have listened to obviously lots of your great podcasts because I love hearing in people's secret lives and the things that they love about their lives. And Sound of Music kept coming up and I thought, poor Nigel, does he have to watch it again and again <laughs> every time somebody <laughs> watches it? But then I thought, well, th- th- if he does, that matches me because I've probably seen that film 40 times in my life. Joe, uh, the dear, reason I don't start, no, we'll, we'll sing our way through the whole interview. <laughs> um, this, the Sound of Music matters to me for, for very many reasons. One is I'm from a family of seven. And there were seven kids in the in the thing. My mum went to a very religious boarding school, Catholic boarding school, which had she stayed on at that school might have led to her becoming a nun. But she asked to leave this boarding school, so she didn't become a nun. So in our head, the seven McInerney kids thought we actually are the Von Trapps <laughs> because our mum was nearly a nun and, <laughs> and there are seven <laughs> of us. And, um, and we used to just watch it all the time. And I also had a a couple of special connections with it that growing up, um, my mum, you know, the the way that kids do, and particularly the seven of us, we'd say to mum, you know, um, I mean, not graphically, but, you know, how how come we got born? How come, you know, where were you? And mum always told me that her and my dad went to see The Sound of Music and were so swept up in the romance and the beauty of it and this incredible love story that it's at the heart of it, that uh, they were rushed, overwhelmed with affection and came home and nine months later I was born. So I always thought I actually had the sound of music to to thank for my very existence. And I love music, you know, I can sing a little bit and um, and this film always really mattered to me. So I thought that's, you know, what an incredible connection, what an amazing thing to be able to say that the sound of music brought me into being. <laughs> Except... When I turned 20, um, I was watching a documentary about The Sound of Music and having watched it, you know, as I said, probably 30 times by that because we used to just watch it as kids all the time. And and another thing that I love about this film is I've grown up with it. So, you know, originally when I watched it, it was about the kids and the playing and the singing and the music. And then as I grew older, I thought... Good heavens, no wonder Julie Andrews likes Christopher Plummer. And you, you know, become aware of that, that tension between them and the witty dialogue and the loaded glances. And, and so I kind of grew up through it and then a bit older and you think, realize, I lo- learned more about the war, the war and the mm. Nazis and what the, the historical, you know, terribly sad story beneath it. So it, it's, it talked to me in lots of layers. But as I said, this special thing that, you know, I was born because of The Sound of Music. And I watched this documentary and they and they said, this wonderful film that was filmed in 1965. And I thought, hold on, I was born in 1965. No. So I rang mum and said, there's that story that I've heard all my life that I, you know, I was conjured into being because of The Sound of Music. I've just watched this documentary and it actually only came out the year I was born. And she said, oh, it must have been your sister I was thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are so, seven. It's hard to keep yeah, there. <laughs> exactly. But, um, but I still is a very important film to me. And, um, and you know, I, as I said, the books I write are all about families and drama and sibling rivalry. So now I have this, you know, particularly poignant bit of sibling rivalry that my sister gets the sound of music story not me that's a, that's a lovely story you, you mentioned your mum went to a quite a religious boarding school um uh, uh, talk to me about religion well, what, what's your journey uh, well there? we i'm um one of a big irish australian catholic family so we all um were raised in the catholic faith and went to the local catholic um 
school, St. Joseph's in Clare. So Clare, where I'm from, is a small town in the wine um, area of the Clare Valley of South Australia. And um, they didn't have a secondary school uh, that was a Catholic school. So we were all educated through the through the Catholic system by um, Josephite nuns, Joeys, as they're called. It was started by Mary McKillop, Australia's first saint. And um, fantastic uh, education to have because the the Joeys, I'm going to just give them their nickname, it's about um, putting yourself in other people's shoes. It's about social justice. They're like the Jesuits that they're in terms of the, the Catholic ethos behind them. It is about um, being, thinking of others less well off than you, um, looking out for other people. So a very good grounding in terms of um, uh, the 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 best way to live in society, I think. So it was a fantastic for me, and also to be to be grow up and become an author was um, was fantastic growing uh, grounding for me because the whole thing about being an author is having to put yourself in other people's shoes. Sure. So to be taught that at a very uh, young age uh, was was you know hugely beneficial, not just to me as a human, but as also as a um, as a writer later. And um, I actually wrote my first book at St Joseph's School. Will I tell you about that? No. Yeah, I tell you, it's um, when I was eight, uh, a nun at my school, her name was Sister Margaret Mary Murphy, and I'm Monica Mary McInerney. Um, she set a school holiday project that we uh, asked us eight-year-olds to write a book uh, during the school holidays. And I was a very earnest young student, and so I took it very seriously. And she said, you know, write what you know. And um, and I thought, right, I'm one of seven kids. My dad's the railway station master here in Clare. So I decided to write about uh, a family that goes on a train trip from Clare in South Australia. And I, the furthest place I could think away was Perth on the other side of the country. I hadn't been there. I don't <laughs> think I'd been to Adelaide actually by then. Um, and I remember I did it on A4 yellow paper. And I did the illustrations and I stapled it on the end and um, and I did all the, like I picked up a picture book at home and I copied, you know, the blurb at the back and my little biog. So proud of myself and I read it to mum and dad and my six brothers and sisters and the cat and the dog and the budgie and the possum and everybody. Then school went back and I went in the first day very proudly with this, you know, this, this book I'd written. And uh, I had given a lot of thought to what the title should be about this family that travels on the train from, from Clare to Perth. And I didn't want to call them the McInerney's because it was hard to spell even though it was my own name. So I called them the Smiths. So the book was called The Smith Family Goes to Perth on the Train. Oh, <laughs> Pretty much that's what happened in this book. <laughs> um, but I was really proud of it. Like they didn't do anything. They got to Perth and they just stood around the railway station and then they came back. <laughs> but... Um, uh, but I was really, really proud of it. And I brought it in and I showed Sister Margaret Mary Murphy and she said, you know, well done. I think possibly I was the only kid that had actually done, you know, the school holiday project. And then I took it in and showed the school librarian who was a, na- a lady called Margaret Milty. So all these M names keep mm. coming up. And she did this extraordinary thing for an eight-year-old. She um, asked me if she could borrow my book and I said, yeah, absolutely. And she covered it in that lovely thick plastic Yes. Uh, school books yeah. She catalogued it and she put it on the shelves of the school library in St. Joseph's in Clare. So for the rest of the time that I was at school, a book I had written was on the shelves of my school library. That and, is um, such a lovely story. I love telling it and I'm, I'm apologies if anybody listening has heard me tell it before, but I love to tell it for two reasons. One is that if you've got kids in your life, never underestimate what the tiny bit of encouragement might do, because I know that planted the seed that one day, you know, I might be a writer, that my, I might have books on shelves um, in other, you know, in other places as well. And, and also I joke that I was the only one that ever borrowed it, but um, but it, it meant the world to me to be taken seriously. And, um, and I also just in the way that the world turns in beautiful circles sometimes, my books are all audio books as well as print sure. books. And um, three of my novels, The Alphabet Sisters and Lola's Secret and The Trip of a Lifetime, which are set in the Clare Valley um, and family dramas and family comedies. Uh, and they are narrated by an Australian actress called Katie Milty, and she is Margaret Milty, the school librarian's daughter. No yeah. way. I love yeah. it. <laughs> well, to talking of authors, we're going to come on to your uh, book choice. And you have chosen uh, Edith Wharton's 12th novel, I mean, fabulous book, but um, famous for, for many reasons, but it was the 1921 Pulitzer Prize winner, the first woman ever to win that prize. Uh, to tell us about The Age of Innocence and your reasons behind it. 
Right. The reason I chose The Age of Innocence was I find it impossible to choose a favourite book because I'm a huge reader. I read two or three books a week. I, I live, eat and breathe. I write books. I read books and, uh, and I read all different genres. And, um, and my husband is a, a great reader as well. And what happened this year is um, I was back in Australia, um, expecting to be back in Australia for a month. And um, and said goodbye to my husband. I usually live in Dublin to my beautiful Irish husband at Dublin Airport on the late February. And you know, big hug. And I'm going home to see my mum and meet my publishers and do some research. See you under a month, darling, and a big hug. If I had known what was ahead, I would have hugged him for a couple of hours. <laughs> um, because the day I was due to fly back to Ireland, um, the borders closed and all the international flights were grounded. So I've unexpectedly found myself in Australia. Yes. And and COVID's turned everybody's lives upside down. And I'm so lucky. I, you know, I have, I can move freely between Australia and Ireland um, and I never take that for granted when I see, you know, refugees and detention centres, et cetera, in, in both my home countries. Um, and also I had a very welcoming family and a mum with a spare room, so <laughs> I've been fine. But John and I, my husband and I, um, we've been talking, we've kept in, you know, we talk to each other every day, video calls and, um, and texts and emails and we couldn't even write to each other, unfortunately, because there was no post between Ireland and Australia. But we started reading the same books Um like, it was like we were having our own little COVID book club. And and obviously if we'd been at home and he'd been reading and and he would have said, oh, Mon, here's, you know, I've just read this, I think you'll love it as well. But he was reading The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton. And I, re- I said, I read a lot, but I read a lot of contemporary fiction. And while I'd found myself here in Australia unexpectedly, I've been absolutely devouring Australian fiction. And I thought, well, this is going to break my, you know, Australian run, but okay. And he said, I just think you'll love it. I think it's like a masterclass in in, um, society manners and uh, in... um, just as a, as a writing, a piece of writing, it's incredible. And obviously we're not the only two people to think that because I won the Pulitzer mm-hmm. Prize. But so I read The Age of Innocence for the first time and I, I, I'm i kind of embarrassed to say this. I kept, I, I marvelled at it, Nigel. I couldn't believe how fantastic it was. It's set in... Um, like she wrote it in the 1920s. It's set in 1870s, like upper class New York yeah, society. Yeah. But, and it follows this, um, this young man who's betrothed to a woman in his same social circle. And then his life gets tipped upside down when he meets her cousin, who's this exotic countess, uh, who's a door, you know, near divorcee. And it's, it's the way his society reacts to him wanting to step outside his own laws, the laws of his society, if you like. And her characterization was just breathtaking for me. That it, I, like time after time, and I was taking. I, I have a tiny little book. I got. I ordered online, and because I love the cover, and it arrived, and it's about five inches big. So it's like I'm carrying it around in the palm of my hand. But I kept taking screenshots of photographs of it to send to John back in Dublin, going, "Look at this paragraph. Look what she's managed to put across in just this incredible, um, you know, just this beautiful lyrical way of writing." It says me stumbling over my words trying to describe how how lyrical she was and the way she ended characters that you had the chapters that you had to yes. read on and then she does this extraordinary thing at the end um that it's set all in 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 that time in the you know the the, the late 1800s and then she jumps 26 years and in all of my novels I, i'm a lover of epilogues as a reader and as a writer that always think when you finish the story but then what happened mm-hmm. and she does that and she does this miraculous thing with her writing that she even switches from the very, I mean, I'm standing stiffly as I'm talking to you, that the the tight little world where they're all watching each other in this New York society and this and 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 it's you know it's a very intimate world but it's global what she's describing the way that we as humans keep an eye on each other and we judge each other and we you know don't want to forgive easily. And then she jumps forward 26 years and the lead character has a possibility of meeting this great love of his life and it's modern time and the, the language relaxes and it's all through his, his son's life and he's much more casual and it just took my breath away. And, 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 and the, 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 the way that it ended, sorry to, to, to yeah. interrupt, but I'm, I'm so pleased you mentioned the ending of that book because he doesn't go up no. to see Ellen, the, no. the love of his life. He hasn't seen her for 25 years or whatever, but he says something that I'd like to ask you about because he says, it's when, it, when the son says, why on earth didn't you go and see the love of your life? You haven't seen her for three decades and she's upstairs. Uh, it's, it's more real to me here than if I went up. If I went up. And, and yeah. I wanted to ask, just because you're such a prolific, uh, um, loved author, is how much do you uh, 
live through your imagination. L- like I imagine winning Wimbledon with a broken arm and everyone cheering and, oh, Nigel, you're a hero. But but no, I don't write a book that people buy. Is how much do you put things in your books that, that you you sort of live through your imagination? Does that make sense? Rather- oh, 100% I do. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about being an author is that you get to live vicariously through yes. all of your characters. And I do it as a reader too, like just to finish on The Age of Innocence, like that ending, what a fantastic ending because as a reader, you read it and he doesn't go up, but then the book's finished. But maybe the next day he went That's up. That's right. And um, and I love to finish, um, like I, I don't describe my novels as having happy endings, but they have hopeful endings because I put all of my characters through the ringers um, and in different ways, emotionally, sometimes physically. Um, I put them through very difficult family situations, personal situations, because I want to test their mettle. I want to see, I'm very interested as a human being and as a writer, as how we're all shaped by the big traumatic, um, devastating events in our life. Um, Because I believe, like personally, I am shaped entirely by grief and love. That's what's made me. I grew up surrounded by solid, you know, solid family love. As I said, I'm in the middle of a family of seven kids. We all knew how loved we were. We, um, and we had a very safe childhood in a gorgeous country town. Um, but, of course, as I've got older, you know, I've, it's like, like trying to travel through a meteor shower. I've, been, I've had them flying at me. I've experienced, you know, enormous grief of the death of my father, which still shakes me. That's 20 years ago. Mm. And, um, and lots of personal sorrows and families and friends going through, you know, devastating times. And each of those shapes you in some way. Like I, I like to describe it that if I was a tree and you cut me in half, you'd see in the rings, you know, that was a good year, that was a bad year, that was a bleak year. And I my books spring from inside me. So they draw on those sad times or those good times or those bad times. And that's the beauty of um, and being an author and having, you know, being able to have all these characters living these different lives that, that I can bring my characters through those terrible sad times like I've had myself in my life. Um, and then bring them through and say, it's going to be okay. You're a different person now than you were before you went through that, but you're okay because you've either lent on another person or if somebody's unexpectedly come into your life, like it does in real life, um, and you'll, you'll be okay. You'll never be the same person again, but you'll have a richer life because of it, uh, richer emotionally than, um, than financially. And so I think I've, because I, I describe that I don't write factually autobiographical books, but I write emotionally autobiographical books. And I know that writing these big stories about people getting through life has helped me get through my own life in the last 25 years since I've started writing fiction. It's wonderful, wonderful hearing you. Uh, and I love that distinction. I, I also I love the distinction between a happy ending and a hopeful ending. Yeah, I, but- I haven't heard it expressed like that before. And that, I mean, I, mean, I, I get a, I, I'm dying to talk to you about the specifics of the plot of The Godmothers, but I was so bloody happy at the end. <laughs> Good, but don't say <laughs> I anything. I did a double fist pump. <laughs> woo <Woo-hoo! laughs> Thank you, Nigel. I'm glad. <laughs> now, we're going to add to the Five of My Life Spotify playlist the first ever Celtic folk stroke rock music song. Uh, now, you have chosen the penultimate track from uh, Moving Heart's debut album, the band that features the sensational Christy Moore, one of my all-time favourites. You've chosen Lake of Shadows, mm. but before you tell us your story, do you know why it's called Lake of Shadows? I do. Well, I know <laughs> as 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 Lo- Lock Swilly, which is what. Now, you tell me. You tell me what your story. So the is, story. Cause... Why the band? This is this is an interview <laughs> that Christy gave, which was hilarious. I, 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 you know, in your honour, I've been watching YouTube clips and blah blah blah, and I watched one concert where he introduced. <laughs> I know what you're going to say. <laughs> and he said, he said we were, you know, writing a song, touring around, blah blah blah, and we were staying in a hotel in Donegal. And it, the hotel was called the Lake of Shadows. So thank Christ it wasn't called Holiday Inn. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. I've seen them introduce that as well. Um, I, this song is very special to me for lots of reasons. Um, uh, so Lake of Shadows is, uh, it, indeed, it's a hotel in um, in Donegal. And uh, it's the lake in question is Loch Swilly, and, uh, which is a beautiful area of Gorgeous. Donegal. And I first heard this song, um, my first job out of school uh, was, so I left, did my matriculation in my year 12 and um, and then I moved to Adelaide from Clare and through various um, 
different chains of events. I got a first job on the Here's Humphrey children's television show, and which has been running as long as I've been alive. And it features basically a, a, a four-year-old bear. So it's a man in a bear suit called Humphrey B. Bear. And this was my first job out of school. And it was just the most fantastic. I, you know, I think that kind of set my life in train as well. You're, you're, not, how... being, you're not being fully honest because the detail <laughs> is you were the dresser and it was. was a bear, for Christ's sake, who doesn't well, wear clothes. Doesn't wear pants, <laughs> I know. And people are very rude because when I say I was Humphrey B. Bear's wardrobe girl, and they say, well, yeah, hard job <laughs> uh, with his waistcoat. But I had to get a lot of costumes for him because the we whole... We believe you. Th- thank you. And well, then you're going to be even ruder because then I went on to write scripts for his Humphrey and Humphrey doesn't speak either. <laughs> and so they were sort of saying, well, you know, that really pushed the boat out too, that, you know, he did, Humphrey gesticulates, Humphrey gesticulates. But <laughs> there were there were humans around him. But I remember this day, Nigel, really clearly, I was in the studio, so we used to record um, five shows really quickly in a couple of days and then we'd do outdoor filming as well. And I was walking across the Channel 9 studios in Adelaide uh, with a, a, a handful of costumes that I would have been dressing Humphrey in later. And every now and then the sound technicians would would um, test the songs that they'd be using as soundtracks to different films. And the studio suddenly filled, so it was a dark studio, and the studio suddenly filled with the most incredible song I thought I'd ever heard. And it was... Celtic and but it wasn't it was traditional Irish music but it had like a rock and roll beat it had kind of a jazz thing happening as well it had um, a saxophone it had this instrument that I had never heard that was like a cry from somebody's soul which I later learned was the Ilian pipes the the amazing Irish um, wind instrument and I stopped still in the studios and thinking what is that? What is that music? It felt like it had gone straight into my soul. And I'm of Irish descent. My great-grandparents and grandparents on both sides were Irish. And we'd grown up in this Irish Catholic, Irish Australian Catholic tradition. But I never had heard of this. And I remember I went up to the sound booth and said, what, you know, what is that? And this guy said, oh, this song came out last year, some 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 Irish band. He said, some Irish band, you know, and it turns out, as you say, it's Christy Moore, Donald Lunny, um, Davis Spillane, all these legends of Irish traditional music um, playing. And this an instrumental. And uh, I think it's got Christy Moore in the bow on, which is the beautiful Irish ham, hand drum. And I played it and I played it. I bought it. I had to go to a shop and get a single and put the single on the record player because I'm so ancient. I'm 55. This is what we had to do, young people. And um, and then I moved to London when I was 19. And I we just it was just what we heard. I saw Moving Hearts live and this beautiful song, The Lake of Shadows and Lock Swilly. And then fast forward um, to when I turned 25, which is about, you know, about eight years after this, and uh, and I met my Irish husband, in, well, my an Irishman in Melbourne who became my husband. And where was he born? Only on Lock Swilly in Donegal. No way. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that so? Have you been and had a romantic dinner in the Lake of Shadows hotel? I've, I've had a I've had a glass of wine in the Lake of Shadows uh, there. So and um, but it's a really I just think that's kind of magical. That I don't know, I don't know whether um, that was you know my Irishness responding, but I like you know I love those kind of coincidences because I think they happen so much more in real life. But you can't put them in books because your editor will make you take them out. But that's yeah, that song's really matters to me for for all those reasons, and it's just a very beautiful piece of music. It's it's so uplifting. Um, I play it sometimes if I'm a bit low and there's a there's a change in the music about three quarters of the way through when it just, it surges and, and it's so joyful. It's a beautiful piece of music. Now, you, you mentioned coincidences and I was telling my wife, I just adore the story and, and, and it might not be uh, true, so you can put me right, about how you met John, where, I mean, I was laughing where some psychic says you're going to meet you know, an Irishman, he's going to be quiet. He'll be 10 years older than him and you'll meet him at 25. And at 25, you yep. met an Irishman that it's was true. 10 years older than you and was quite quiet. I mean, just fabulous. It's absolutely true. And um, and people don't believe it when I tell it. And again, if I put that in a novel, but sure enough, yeah, when I was 22, nearly 23, a, a psychic, a friend of my flatmate at the time in Melbourne, told me all those things. that um, And and I was very matter of fact about it because she was very, very uh, down to earth. Like she wasn't all wafty and, you know, we didn't have to have incense burning. She was literally a friend of my flatmates and she came over for dinner and she did a reading on both of us. And it's come true for both of us. And um, but hers, this one was amazing. And so in my family, this this fella that she told 
me about, you know, that you know, when you're 25, yeah, Irish or Scottish, 10 years older, and you've been together in all these past lives. And so this, this time when you meet, this is the soulmates meeting. And so he instantly became in my family where he was called Captain 25. <laughs> and um, so I rang my three sisters and said, great news, you know, get the wedding dresses ready, but He's not here. just yet. <laughs> yeah. 20, so I had to wait until I was 25. And then a, a friend of mine rang up um, from the newspaper and said, this quiet, sad faced Irishman has just started work here. And I had turned 25 two months earlier. So I'd been, you know, where is he? Not yeah. very punctual. And um, and I said, how old is he? And she said, oh, I don't know, um, mid-30s. And I hung up from her and rang my sisters. We've, we've found him. <laughs> <laughs> and we've been together ever since, 30 years now. No, no, and I need to know if you have the number of that psychic because does she do horse, <laughs> does she do horse races? <laughs> I don't know. Apparently she found it very difficult. Like it was because so much of what she told people did come true. Oh. And um, she... she I'm still very good friends with my the friend flatmate, but I must ask him what you know what became because it was a difficult. It wasn't easy for her because she felt so in tune with what was happening, and I'm quite sceptical, mm. Nigel. Like I, I wouldn't have, make a habit of going to see fortune tellers or psychics, and certainly never did after that one came true. Uh, and I'm still open. You know, did I make that happen? Because my friend, if if she hadn't said that to me, my friend rang up and said, oh, quite a sad-faced Irishman started, would I have just changed the subject and said, well, what, you know, where will we go to dinner tonight? But because she told me, am I sure. open to something? I mean, it's, you know, it's, a, it's such a, but I think there's magic in the world. I do. Yeah, and, and also things haven't got to have uh, to be preordained. It's just lovely if they work. Yes, yeah. exactly. But I think absolutely if I'd put that in one of my books, there would be, it would come back with a big red pen through Come it. on, Monica. <laughs> <laughs> Your place on Five My Life is the Clare Valley. Now, I, uh, again, I'm embarrassed to say this, I'm, I'm, I'm an immigrant and I've only been here 19 years and I, and I haven't done South Australia, but I have been to a place and spent the happiest week of my life, or one of them, finishing a book that I wrote in a place called North Bundalia. Do you know? Oh, of course I know North Bundalia. There you go. Yeah. So, anyway, so, so, so you've chosen the Clare Valley and yes. North Bundalia is in the Clare Valley, so I know well, how you beautiful driven- it is. You would have driven through my hometown then on the way to North Bundalia because that's, right. that's a big a big old station, one of the oldest stations in the Clare Valley. What a picturesque place to finish your book. Oh, Which just, book, your first book or your second book or your third uh, book? I, actually, it was um, uh, Overworked and Underlaid, my second Ah, book. very good. That's next on my list. <laughs> um, anybody listening, I heartily recommend Fat, Forty and Fired. I'm reading it and loving it. So oh, thank you, Nigel. <laughs> I wish we could switch around and ask you the questions, but <laughs> maybe I'll be obedient today. Um, yeah, I grew up in the Clare Valley and I... I feel very lucky in so many ways, as I mentioned earlier, to have grown up in this big, uh, lively, noisy, talkative, argumentative, action-packed family. But I'm also very lucky to have grown up in a physically beautiful place um, because, as I mentioned, I think that I nature photography is what I love and I know that's taking me back to, as a kid, being surrounded by the countryside. And my dad was a station master. So we grew up in the station master's house, which was this big, gorgeous house just next to the station. Uh, so we could be railway kids, like we used to play on the railway tracks. We would run, you know, do our own Olympic Games. And one of the events was, you know, the 100 metre balance on the railway lines. Um, there was a stockyard nearby because the, the trains would bring sheep and, and, um, and cattle. And the stock market, the stock market was just up near us. So we would jump over the fences and that was our hurdles and our Olympics. But we could also um, just go to this the town, like so we were a five-minute walk down to the main street, so we could be town, country town kids. But across the road from our house was the Clare Hills, so gum trees and, and all the undergrowth of Australian bush, basically. And we we had, we had found an old quarry up there. We, there were creeks that sometimes had water in them. Um, there were spiders and possums and, you know, snakes and all of that and we could move very easily between um between those those lives we also grew up in this fantastic house um that was a big rambling house and when mum and dad moved there they had no kids and then then they had all seven of us and we kind of joked that we're lucky it was so big or it might be short a couple of brothers and sisters um but also it's the it's a wine growing area it's beautiful riesling and um and beautiful reds and um my you know, a couple of my brothers worked in the wine industry for a while I, we couldn't see vineyards from where our house was, but there was a, a winery just down the road. So I grew up 
to the sound of the, the clanking of the machine, the tractors bringing the grapes, the smell of a winery town during vintage. We grape picked. My first job was as a grape picker, paying you know, 10 cents a bucket, which quite frankly is a ripoff. Um, it's slave labour. And uh, so to grow up in a in a place where your surroundings, like an agricultural area, um, even though, you know, my, as I said, my dad was a station master, not a winemaker or a farmer, but I'm a country kid to my bones and I still love being back in Clare. Um, I, I, every one of my books I launch at the Clare Town Hall where as a kid I used to perform in the musicals and, you know, and then, then there's me now I'm there and, you know, recently like um, Penguin, my publishers are fantastic. I, they, they get us lovely drivers to take us places and it, it was like a scene from a film like the, the, this beautiful car pulls up in front of the Clare Town Hall and the, the driver hops out and opens the door for me to step <laughs> out <laughs> to do a talk in the Town Hall, you know, my hometown. And it just amused me so much because, of course, the first people I saw as soon as I step out is really old family friends of ours, the Smiths, actually, who I named my, <laughs> the Smith family, go to Perth on the train after. And they were laughing, says, look at you getting out of the fancy car. And I said, yeah, look, you know, only for another week, then I go back to being me. Um, and it's just a special, it's a beautiful place. I really recommend anybody to to go to the Clare Valley. It's a, uh, it's a series of lots of little like villages and towns full of wineries. Um, the railway line that my dad used to mind as the station master, it got burnt in the uh, 1980s bushfires and that hastened the end of the railways very sadly. Um, and it was, you know, my dad was a railway man to his bones from the age of 14 and it was heartbreaking for him that it, it ended. But the railway line uh, is now the Riesling Trail that runs through the whole valley and it's a walking and cycling path. And when I was there you know, last week, I went for a long walk on my own and gum tree and the galahs and the lorikeets and the magpies and uh, and you, you can just lose yourself. It's so peaceful. Um, and the, like, loads of the little wineries have cafes attached and restaurants and you can stay in old, you know, settlers' cottages. Uh, yeah, and I, I've set three, four, five of my novels have Clare Valley settings. So uh, It's wonderful hearing you talking about <laughs> it. But, but reading about your childhood in research for this conversation, um, I... I couldn't help but think about your book choice that was describing sort of society in New York, a, a world that, you know, for all its faults, uh, you know, was a world that was distinct, but that has now gone. And, and when, when I look in at your childhood, the sort of the Von Trapp children, the, the, the McInerney's, you, you know, that the hilarious story of your wheels are turning when you're <laughs> sh- shouting at abuse at cyclists. But it just seems so idyllic and innocent and wonderful and, and although the Clare Valley now is a gorgeous, fabulous place to, to, to visit, it, it's sort of, I don't think people are going to have your childhood again. They probably aren't going to have the library books delivered on the train and the Christmas Santa and all the wonderful. So I, I just was reminded of the age of innocence because your childhood just sounded so, so delightful. I'm, I'm sure it had its problems, but. Gosh, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. That it, it is actually it's the perfect title for that. And um, and I, yeah, as I said, I love childhood. I didn't like adolescence. Um, and of course, my family, like every family in the whole world, has been through um, so many, you know, sorrows and and disappointments and and dangerous times and scary times because we're human beings and that's what happens. But I think that's why I hold that uh, that beautiful childhood with such love and joy to my heart because I do think that's what formed me, you know, that the, um, and the constant, the constant arrival of visitors and family and friends and, and, and interestingly in a way that with Edith Wharton with The Age of Innocence where she, she's able to portray so much about human life through the lens of that high society. I learned growing up in a small town um, in lots of ways in the way that Agatha Christie says, you know, that's why she set so many of her books because all life happens in in an English village. In a turns out all life happens in a small Australian country town too because we had, you know, we might have only had one immigrant family. We had one Indigenous family. We had, you know, one family that lived in terrible poverty. But growing up in that, you are absolutely exposed to every every factor of, of life, racism, um, sexism, um, ageism, um, sporting careers, more intellectual careers, you know, having to leave home because there's not jobs in your area. And I think sometimes in a way that if I'd grown up as a city kid, I wouldn't have seen all that sure. stra- those stratas because, and also that, you know, that stage where we were going to mass every Sunday as kids. And so, uh, you know, we, we'd, all those conversations that happen after that, we were very involved in sport. 
um, the, the musical society, as I said, and just small town life, really. And then mum worked in the local library, you know, dad, the station master. And so I saw, and I was very curious, eavesdropping kind of a child. I'm curious, eavesdropping kind of an adult. And I noticed all of that, really. And, um, and I think I still draw on all of that too, too, in my, in my novels and in my writing that, you know, I saw great sadnesses and, and marriage breakups of friends. And, and because in a small town, it's not like, oh, we're going to go off to the cinema and, and not pay heed to what's going on in the house. And also I, I grew up, um, like, you know, I really remember lying in bed at night time and hearing mum and dad and their friends talking from the kitchen and the voices coming through and the way that they'd rise and fall. Uh, they're really political. Like they'd have these great political and theological arguments and, um, but also a lot of really great storytelling. My dad was really funny and great storyteller. My mum's a great storyteller. And dialogue writing is my favourite part of my books. And I'm sure that's from being, sure. you know, I'd lie there as a kid and I'd, you know, okay, why are they lowering their voices? What's going on? And then you'd hear that roar of laughter and then, you know, a bit argumentative. And I love, it was like this beautiful soundtrack of voices. And, and maybe that would have, you know, maybe that's a country childhood too. So I do, I really feel that I was very lucky. There's a wonderful phrase where kids learn most from what they hear from the top of the stairs. Oh, that's very good. Yeah, yeah no, that's no, very no, good. Now tell me, um, why didn't you like adolescence? Um, oh, I never felt comfortable in my skin. Like, I don't, does anybody like adolescence? I don't think they do, do they? Brad I, Brad, well, maybe, but then I look at him now. See, so that didn't end well. <laughs> See, um, I think I just found it very awkward, really. Um, and what, what um, boys and all that stuff, or yeah, and and I wasn't a popular, you know, I wasn't popular, and you know, I didn't have a boyfriend when my friends did, and and it, I sort of felt, um, yeah, I, I wanted it to be over. I wanted to get out in the world. I kind of, sure. as I said, I loved my childhood. But, um, and, and I did love, like, Claire High School was great. And again, to pay tribute to a great teacher, I had a really good English teacher who, his name was Jim Stokes. And he, he noticed that there was something, he said, I, you know, there's something about your writing, keep at it, you know. And so I, there's lots of very many moments I'm grateful. But even though I'm talking to you, I'm saying, I'm kind of squirming, just remembering. Have I you triggered know, like, you? No, just, you know, <laughs> like, what do you wear? And, and you're so self-conscious about what you look like. And, and I've got, you know, 18 gorgeous nieces and nephews, and some of them are coming through adolescence. And I can, and I'm watching them suddenly become self-conscious. Do you know, and that yeah. way that the kids have that gorgeous um, earnestness and, and um, uh, confidence. And then when the hormones come flying in and you see them, you know, they they suddenly think that they're not good looking enough or, you know, and, and this is, you know, I grew up before social media, you know, God help them uh, with what kids have to do now. Um, so I think it's an awkwardness and I... Yeah, I, I I need to write it out of myself. Like I've written a lot about younger characters, but I think I need to touch on um, just that awkwardness of adolescence because I reckon I'm going to um, hit a few gold seams in my head that I haven't kind of I, I unearthed can't yet. Wait <laughs> to read! I cannot wait to read. Now, oh, you'll squirm when you read them because I'm squirming <laughs> just thinking about it. I know where this comes from. Now we're moving on to to my favourite of the five questions, or, or usually my favourite, which is your possession. And I'm looking at a picture of it, and it is a. It's like a number plate for the house. It says 575. Could you describe it for us, please, and tell us the story to. behind it? It's an oval and it's a piece of metal. It's a piece of, um, uh, and it's been painted white and it's about the size of, uh, it would fit in the palm of your hand. And it's got, it's white, painted white, and then on, on it it's got 575 painted in black paint and then it's got two holes on either side. And when I was growing up in that gorgeous railway station master's house that I talked about, um, the railways had lots of houses for their employees all around the state and they didn't go by the addresses. Each station house had a number above its above its um, front door and that's how it was referred to. So the paint, you know, the railway had their own painter so they would come around and say, okay, so this year we're going to paint, you know, 575 and 432 and 617 or whichever houses. And one year when the painters came to our gorgeous big rambling house in um, in Clare, the painters took down this this disc, this metal disc, and, um, and gave it to Dad and said, oh, we'll put that back up when we finish. And they never did. And it lived in my dad's bedside table for years. And in 1999, my, my lovely father, Steve, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And we had an extraordinary year of the whole family coming 
back and close as we could. We'd all lived overseas and lived in different parts of the country. And we came back as much as we could together to have this final year with Dad. We knew there was some treatment, but it was pancreatic cancer, which doesn't have, you, you tend to get a year. And it was a time of great sorrow, but a time of great grace for our family um, that we were able to get to know our father again in a very different way than you do as kids. Uh, the, the very essence of my father shone through. He beca- we just we used to all describe the smile he gave, particularly in his final months, that it would it would fill a room with light. And um, and Dad had had difficult times after the railways closed. It wasn't easy for him. This was his life, and it was taken from him. And you know, th- things things were tough for him. And yeah, this year for all of us became this extraordinary year of special times with Dad. And we were able to keep my father at home. He only had a few stints in hospital, but one of my sisters was a trained palliative care nurse, and so she was able to work with the palliative care people. But as I've said, she wanted she was a daughter first and a palliative care nurse second. But we we had dad at home and dad was um, able, dad spent his final months and days uh, in the railway house in Clare. And about a month, some weeks before he died, I was up and he was still able to sit up at that stage. It, the, the end when it came was, was swift. But, um, and we were talking and he'd opened that bedside table and, um, and my family nickname is Mick. And he said, oh, Mick, I, I found, I found this in my drawer. And I said, oh, and he showed me it. And I said, oh, gosh, the, the, the number disc the, of the house. And I was holding it because I, I remembered, you know, the painters coming and just, you know, my whole childhood growing up in that beautiful house. And here I was with my dad who I knew would be saying goodbye to pretty soon. And dad said, um, Mick, would you like to have that? And I said, I would love to. So uh, I've had that for 20 years now. And uh, it's my key ring. It's my talisman. I usually carry it in my bag with me. And, uh, and it means the world to me that, that it was from dad. And that was his kind of his last gift to me. Um, he's given me many other gifts, I think, interest in people and storytelling, love for storytelling. But um, that's a kind of a concrete gift from him. Oh, and, th- and he died about a month after that at home. He died in, in the house, in his beautiful bedroom that overlooked the station and uh, all of us with him well, and with two of two of the, my brothers were on their way but we were all physically or spiritually with him when he died at, in that in our beautiful house I, I find that such a moving touching story and and you know yet again it it, it goes to why I love the fifth choice so much because people like yourself come on and they uh you know they authentically share that's a real privilege to hear that story and, and what, what a what an amazing man. His smile that lights up a room. Gosh, that's a... Oh, it was beautiful. Sorry, now I'm crying. But we all, we all used to marvel at it. And we, uh, like, Dad was a big man. You know, he, he, was, he was overweight for a lot of his life. And then what cancer does is it, it shrinks you to your very essence. And, um, and we didn't, you know, we, we saw a photo recently of Dad about two months before he died. And there was nothing to him. You know, he'd been this big man. And, and it shocked me to see the photo because... My memory of Dad in that last year was, as I said, just his grace and his spirit and his love, and um, and to see that oh God, no, why were we surprised when he died? Look, there was nothing, you know, he was like skin and bone, and but the smile, the smile of him, you know, when you'd walk into your room, and I remember saying to him once, I, I will cry when I say this, that um, I just said, you know, uh, I love you, I love you so much, Dad, and he said, not as much as I love you. <laughs> And that's one of the final things he said to me too. So, you know, how lucky am I to have grown up with that, knowing that love. Wonderful. I just, this has been such a lovely, I'm sorry, to, sorry to make you cry. I'm wiping sorry. my eyes. Well, <laughs> um, oh dear me, I composed me. No, I'm all right. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm going to force you to do one more question, which right. is who would you like to hear on Five of My Life next and why? Oh, now I would like to ask you to do lots of people because I love these conversations. I love anything where you ask people to to pick something from their lives. But I would like you to ask a really old friend of mine and she's a wonderful um, TV presenter and food writer and food lover. Her name is Maeve O'Mara and Maeve and I met uh, 30 years ago in Dublin when I was working as a book publicist and she rang up to talk to one of the authors that I was helping to promote at the time and two Australian accents 
uh, oh, g'day, g'day. And we met and had a coffee the next day and have been friends ever since. And um, and I know Maeve's children and we keep in constant touch and Maeve helped me with the food references in one of my earlier novels. And Maeve has one of the biggest enthusiastic hearts of anybody I know. And she travels the world and she loves the world and she's it's, she's about food and family. And, uh, and she's had an extraordinary life. And I think... I would love to hear her answer your questions. So it's as much curiosity in my heart part because when you've been friends with somebody for so long, you can't say, you know, tell me again about, you know, that because you think you should know it by then. So I want you to ask her so I can listen. It would be an absolute pleasure to do that. Uh, Absolutely wonderful. Monica McInerney, thank you so much for sharing your choices on Five of My Life. Thank you, Nigel, for making me cry and for your great questions. And it was really great to talk to you too. The Five of My Life was presented by me, Nigel Marsh. Producer, Alex Mitchell. Sound production and theme music by Darcy Thompson and Matt Nicholish. 